Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the country's biggest stars. And we've got one for you today. Rosemary Connolly, how are you? I'm very well. It's lovely to see you again, Alex. We've been doing this a lot, really. I look back over the last 20 years and we've spoken so many times. A, you're looking magnificent. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you very much, except for my arthritic feet, which is a real pain. And for somebody who's spent her 46 and a half year career teaching aerobics and being very, very active, it has been a life changer. No question about that. Could that be something to do with it, that you have pounded your feet more than most to keep this amazing body? Well, I think it's partly that. Not so much in more recent years, but in those early days, when we first started doing aerobics around the Jane Fonda time, we were wearing jazz shoes. We had no training whatsoever. We were working out on concrete floors with a thin bit of carpet on. And I think that's probably where it started. And I think also, I'm 70 now, so 55 years of wearing high heels, I think, has contributed. <laughs> Are you amazed with your success? When we look at your career, I mean, you built this empire where these ladies got together and you literally changed their lives, didn't you? Yes. I mean, it, I have had a massive privilege in the work that I've done. Uh, I've written books. I've run classes. I've done presented fitness DVDs and videos. And one of the loveliest things is that people will come to me and say, in fact, recently I went and spoke at a lunch, a ladies' lunch, and this lady and her husband were there. And she said, I work out to your video and the same video and I have done for the last 15 years every single day. And I just see working, in, working out with somebody in their living room every day is one of the biggest privileges I could possibly have because you listen to somebody on the radio, which is lovely, and you could turn them on or off, but you know they're on the radio. When they're actually working out with me and they're doing what I'm asking them to do, that is just such a privilege, and I love it. And I've done 31 fitness videos, DVDs, uh, and I've written the 36 books. Um, and, of course, we had the clubs up until 2014. Um, and, you know, I've just been unbelievably privileged to have had such a successful career. Do you still work out to your own DVDs? Uh, no, not generally speaking. I still teach some of the routines from them. In my, I still take classes myself, uh, which I do at a golf club in Bristol on a Monday night. So it's, some of those ladies have been coming to me for over 30 <laughs> years, which is just lovely. And, you know, now some of them, they're in their late 70s, early 80s. And they're fit just because they've come to that one class a week for the last 30 years. I love it. And so, and of course, now we do online. Rosemary Conley Online is what I'm involved with now. And uh, we love that. And I only today, I was reading a letter from somebody who's reached her goal. And she just said, I just want to thank you all. It's changed my life. I never thought I could get to this weight. And that's what we do, what we do. It's a remarkable story and success. I wonder as a child, were you always interested in your appearance and your fitness? When did this become a thing that would change your life forever? Um, I was always active. Uh, as a kid, I always had animals. I organised pet shows. I always loved horse riding. Uh, so I was never still. So that was something that was there. One little story there was when I was a kid, um, six, seven years old, I would come home from school and we put the old gramophone on and I, in our sort of room that we had at Counterthorpe, uh, we had a wooden floor in what today would be called a garden room. And I would just skate on my socks in this garden room. Little did I know that it would be another sort of 60 odd years before I would get onto the ice itself. And then was, of course, on Dancing on Ice in 2012, which was just amazing. So uh, that was a very, very, very thrilling thing. And as far as when you look back, right, what did you... I was, I was quite good at exercise when I was at school. So I could... If we were doing, um, we used to do Movement to Music, a really sexy title that is, <laughs> <laughs> but Movement to Music within a PE class. And I was often brought out and sort of said, right, watch Rosemary. So I, I was sort of, I didn't mind performing in front of people. And as far as my favourite subject at school was concerned, I suppose it was English. I enjoy English. So you put those together and you realise, right, fitness DVDs, writing books, you know, and those are the things that you do. And then we look at this generation which seem to have 
everything they want. They've got iPhones, so they can order now McDonald's to be delivered to their home via Uber. You can have a pizza delivered quicker than you get an ambulance. It's an interesting time to be young and wealthy if you've got money for fast food. There are more options than ever. Do you worry, is this generation going to pay the price of all this temptation? Because with this glorious fun food comes glorious amounts of calories. I think you've absolutely summed it up. Eating high, uh, high calorie, calorie dense food so easily and rather affordable these days is absolutely frightening. Uh, when I was younger, we would, my mother would shop once a week. The food that she would buy would have to last us the week. You wouldn't dream of, I mean, if you had fish and chips, that was the equivalent of dining out. Uh, and it was just a completely different world. And of course, Kids are on um, gameplay type of equipment where they don't have to move except they're using their brains, which is a good thing, but they're not moving physically. And as a consequence of that, they are piling on the pounds. And it's a whole culture which is just working against them being fitter. And I think one day it's going to go boom because I cannot see where this it cannot escalate anymore without us having people who are obese by the time they're 10 and morbidly obese by the time they're 15 or 16. Who is to blame? Is it the parents for letting them have it? Is it the suppliers for selling it? Or is it personally us for not having the control that we should have? I think it's a combination of all three. One of the things that really, really annoys me is the meal deals. So that you'll go into a petrol station and you'll buy your fuel and you'll say, oh, you can have a massive Cadbury's bar of or any other bar of chocolate and it's a pound instead of the normal three pounds or whatever. Or I was on a flight recently and you could, and you, I got a free chocolate bar as because I'd had a drink and I'd had a sandwich um, and I said, I don't want it, thank you. And she said, but it's free. I said, but I don't want it but it's free. I know it's free and I don't want it because I don't want to get fat. And it's as simple as that. And so those things are working against us. Now, when you go to the fast food things, yes, I think the parents have got something to answer for because not all of them, of course, but some of them, they're going, they're out at work. I'm not knocking anybody for that, but it's easier to say, here's five pounds, go and get yourself a pizza or whatever. Um, if you are busy and being busy working, you've both been busy, you get home, you think, oh, I can't be bothered to cook. And so therefore you send out for a takeaway um, and then it becomes tempting. And then you eat more than you should because you don't want to go hungry. You never think you, you've got to take away and you're scraping the barrel. You always want to think there's a bit left over because you've had more than enough. Um, and all of these work and educate us towards eating too much and eating the wrong foods. I think we should absolutely concentrate on bringing domestic science or whatever it's called, home economics, is what uh, they should be doing in schools. Learning how to cook, learning about healthy vegetables, having healthy meals. And, you know, uh, it's good that Jamie Oliver really helped with the healthier meals. That's good. Uh, They have got to be educated. And when they're at school, they're at their most educational time, particularly the little ones. Let them understand about vegetables and fruits and so on. Did you ever think there'd be a more depressing day that you could go on an app and get McDonald's delivered? That's got to be concerning because that just leaves temptation late at night to people who have perhaps had a drink who know no better. I think it's shocking. Um, I think it's incredibly sad. And it just goes to show that despite the fact that there are people in poverty, which is criminal, that there are, there are lots of people who are spending their money completely inappropriately and making themselves overweight and unhealthy what they don't realize they're enjoying it now because they're young and they're sort of maybe in their you know their teens their 20s 30s 40s and it may be that they're getting away with it when they get to older age and i sort of particularly am relevant to this now because i've hit 70 if my arthritis had hit me now and i was four stone overweight i would be in a wheelchair there is absolutely no question about that i would not be able to work to walk now if unless these people change their eating habits they're going to end up in a wheelchair too. Are you shocked also by the naivety of people who go in these wonderful coffee shops and have one of these fabulous coffees that have got 900 calories in and then have a cookie that's another 400 calories and before you know it, you've nearly eaten your entire day of calories just in a snack in a coffee shop? 
I think a lot of people just don't realise what they're eating. And sometimes they don't want to know how many calories they're eating. And they're going into a coffee shop, having a sociable cup of coffee, innocently sounding, and a cake, innocently sounding, with a friend, uh, which previously would have just been a treat on occasions. Do it on a regular basis and you could be eating thousands of calories. And it's a question of, I don't like the word diet. I don't want people to go on a diet diet. I want people to eat healthily. I want people to make choices about, is this food doing me good? Let's go and do some exercise, because if we're going to do some exercise, then we're burning calories, making our heart and lungs much fitter. We're preventing a million types of different um, health problems that we're going to be smitten with later on. And we're going to find ourselves living life much more fully if we're fitter. So as well as talking about the foods that make you fat, you need to talk about what actions can you do that's going to make you healthier and slimmer. And without a question, exercise is it. Because um, as the um, chief medical officer have said, the current one and the previous one, if you could put the benefits of exercise into a pill, the NHS would give it to everybody because the difference and the benefits that it makes to our body is absolutely extraordinary. And we should absolutely incorporate exercise. It doesn't mean going to the gym if you don't want to. It means going for a 20 minute walk. It means using the stairs instead of the escalator or the lift. It means cycling to work. It means doing a sport. It means going out at the weekend, not just sitting watching the telly. And as you may remember, when we first met, I was 18 and a half stone. And you said to me, you can't keep doing these diets, which is what you just referred to. And you said it's got to be a way of life. Cutting five stone quickly and putting six stone back on is never going to help. And I think there's a lot of adverts on TV I see that seem to encourage that, that have these plans that are unmanageable and unlivable. You've got to be careful, haven't you, with these sort of quick fixes that quickly become unfixable afterwards. First of all, you have to be aware that on the television, um, any advertisement has to meet the Advertising Standards Authority guidelines. And that means, and this is any advertising, should meet those guidelines by saying that you follow a calorie controlled diet, that you lose a maximum of two pounds a week and that you do it in, you know, in, with healthy foods. Now, of course, the marketeers get round this in a variety of different ways. Uh, there are all sorts of products out there that can help a quick fix, but they do not change your lifestyle. And that's when people put the weight back on. And that I absolutely, um, I'm so appalled at the products that are quick, fit, quick fixes that don't change lifestyles. Powders that are meal replacements, I hate them. Um, Ready meals can work really well. Just be aware of the salt and the sugar in them and so on. Uh, and it is more important that you learn about what you should be eating, that you should be eating three meals a day, a breakfast, a lunch and a dinner, that you don't eat snacks between meals because snacks between meals are where you put your weight on. You're talking about the, you know, the, the possibility of having a cake and, and, a, and a very high calorie coffee in a coffee shop. Um, don't have those on a regular basis for sure. And if you must have something between meals, then have a small piece of fruit. But if you stick to your three meals a day, eat low fat, eat regularly, moderate your alcohol, then you can lose weight. But don't try. It didn't take you, didn't take you five weeks to put five stone on. Right. It went on over a few, you know, months and years. If it takes you a year to lose it, fine. And of course, once you lose weight, one of the fears is that you're going to have saggy skin and all that. And I think that's what you're about, isn't it? That the body's got to keep up with the weight loss so it doesn't look ridiculous and become embarrassing because that's the next problem. You almost create a problem by losing big amounts of weight. And I think that's one of the reasons why some people put their weight back on because they actually don't like the saggy skin. But it doesn't have to be like that. If you exercise, your t skin will tone up. I have seen slimmers who have been on my diets historically one lady in particular I've used in my books, she came for a photo shoot. She'd lost 11 stone. She looked absolutely huge in her before photograph. And there she was with me 
trying on clothes for a photo shoot in her bra and pants and she had not got one bit of saggy skin. She looked incredible. I did a photo shoot only last year. Four girls, one had lost six, one five and a half and the other two, three and four, something like that. They're all size eight or ten. It was fantastic and they were so toned up and it's all because we advocate exercise alongside your diet, your eating, your healthy eating plan. You have to exercise and then you'll look fantastic and then you won't want to put the weight back on. So, of course, once you've lost the weight, the next issue people face is the skin reduction to make your body look nice. Because what can happen is we see these documentaries, don't we, on Channel 5 of these people who have stalactites of skin swinging under their arms and things like that. You believe there is a way to avoid that and you've proved it over the years. Without a question of a doubt, uh, if you exercise while you're losing weight, then you really can reduce that unbelievably. Uh, and I've seen it. I've seen it with my slimmers. We've featured somebody in one of my books and was doing a photo shoot and she'd lost, it was either 10 or 11 stone. And she, it was a really big, she really did look like a barrel in her before pictures. And there she was, this perfect size eight. And she hadn't got one little bit of saggy skin. She did a hundred sit-ups every day, admittedly. But she just looked amazing. In fact, I said, I want to photograph you in your bra and pants because you look so good. And she's in one of my books in her bra and pants. Um, and it, she's just extraordinary. And that's all because of exercise. Now, how does that work? It happens because when you exercise, you take in more breath through into your lungs. You need your body is demanding more oxygen. So it takes more breath in. That goes through your lungs. It goes, the oxygen goes into your bloodstream. Your heart is pumping it around. And the blood, very oxygenized blood, is coming into your, into your um, muscles. And your muscles, when they're exercising, burn fat through the muscles. And they need the oxygen to do that. They're drawing the fat. And then they take the oxygen and they burn fat in the muscles. And that makes it. And of course, what's, what's just underneath our skin is the muscles. So when your muscles are working so hard, that makes the skin tighter and healthier. And that's how you make your body shrink as you lose the weight. That's how it works. Don't do any exercise, lose the weight. You're going to end up with a saggy baggy body. You really are. I also have sympathy that people are misled. We saw a story this week that a salad in one of these takeaway places has more calories than a Big Mac. That's ludicrous, surely. It's so it's so misleading. That's what annoys me because somebody would go and say, well, I, you know, I went to wherever and had a salad and you think you're being good. And then to realise it's got more calories than, than whatever the big burger option is. That's shocking. That is shocking. And so they could try and find a way of having a low calorie, low fat salad, which is tempting without having to pile on those calories. It's just, I'm not surprised people get confused. Losing weight and calorie count accounting and, and all the different diet arguments. Some will say low carb, some will say um, you know, high carb, some will say don't eat after such and such a time have five meals a day and some will have high fat some will have low fat it's so confusing um my mantra is for me it's low fat some people will say i'm balmy and it's old-fashioned all i can tell you is it blooming well works well it certainly works for you the one i don't get at the moment is i'm going to eat monday to friday but i'm not eating saturday and sunday i can only eat an apple that sounds ludicrous that's a bit extreme um i think uh, the 5-2 diet works for some people. And I think you can have a bit more than just an apple. <laughs> um, Surely, yeah. though, that's not a way to live. I mean, the, the thing you taught me was if you can make your life work around your food and vice versa and you don't notice it, that's when you've won. If your day is around focusing on food, you've already got an issue, haven't you? Because you're then obsessing about it and then it becomes the most important thing and then it becomes a drama, which is never going to work long term. That, 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 you're absolutely right. But the 5-2 diet, and I did the 3-2-1 diet, which is 
a more generous version of the 5 2 diet. You, you have 800 calories on your light days and on your normal days. I'm not quite as generous because I'm saying, no, don't go and have your burgers and your chocolates either. Um, but you can eat normally if you like. Um, on, so first week, it's three days of light days. After week, after week one, you then go on to two days of light. And then for maintenance, you have one day per week, which is why we call it 3 two, one diet. So how does that work? Well, it works because some people, not everybody, let me emphasize, for some people, it works really well to be able to think, right, I can be really good for two days. And then the rest of the time, I just don't have to worry about it. And if I'm out socially at the weekend, then I can go out and not worry about it. It's fine. But if you're somebody who's in inverted commas, I use this word carefully, a fatty, then I was a fatty. I was somebody who loved food, who binge ate and who could not be let loose. Um, this would be a disaster for me. I think, oh, I can have a choc ice and oh, let's have a biscuit. <laughs> and oh, do you know what? I do. I really love those chocolates. I would be having those on my light, my normal days, not my light days, but I'd be very good on the light days. So I couldn't be trusted on my normal days. So it has to be somebody who's not a foodie right. and not a fatty in the truest sense of the word. Somebody, I sort of describe somebody like that, somebody who just wants food all the time, that the most important thing in their life is food then they absolutely would not get on with that diet. Yeah, it wouldn't work for me. I could eat dinner after I've had dinner most nights. Right. Uh, I mean, I used to be like that. Uh, I can remember as a um, early 20s being so obsessed by food that I would have in my little drawer at the side of my desk, I had a packet of fig rolls and a packet of butter. And I'd take a fig roll and I'd scrape the butter <laughs> off the top and I would eat it. And through the day, I would eat the whole half pound of butter and the whole packet of fig. And then I would, uh, another day, I would take my lunch with me and then go down into the Chinese restaurant below where I worked and have a whole three course Chinese dinner. So I know all about overeating, oh, wow. absolutely do. But I don't now. One of the miracles of being older is my stomach, actually, for the first time, it took me, I think it didn't start till I was about 60. Suddenly, I'd be halfway through me and I think, I've had enough. It's a miracle. Oh, so I'm very grateful. It doesn't mean to say I can't put a few pounds on, but I, would, I wouldn't put a lot of weight on now. Do you have any opinion on whether this has become more a medical issue than a personal discipline issue? Because it is costing the NHS millions. There is no doubt that, and it's been said for many years, that if everybody carries on eating and becoming obese, it will cripple the NHS because everybody will get type 2 diabetes and it will just cost billions and millions and billions every year. Um, I think we have to take responsibility ourselves. I don't think we can ask the government to bail us out. I think that we have to educate our children. I think that's absolutely crucial. What if the parents don't know? That's always the issue, isn't it? If the parents don't understand the food that they're eating, how can they pass on the knowledge to eat better to their children? But often children will go home and talk to their parents and say, I don't want to eat that. I should be eating vegetables or I should be. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that everybody's going to say, oh, yes, all right, we'll do that tomorrow then. Um, but they do have to have a dialogue about it and you have to learn I don't know any other other options, to be honest. I think the government could stop the meal deal offers where you're being given extra food that you weren't even thinking of having that chocolate bar or that packet of crisps and suddenly you're given it. Right. I think that's absolutely, utterly wrong. And I think vending machines in offices should be banned um, and there should be healthy things in there. So that if you want to have something unhealthy and then you've got a plan to go and get it, not have it there right under your nose. Mm. I think those are the sorts of things which, but at the end of the day, we're responsible for what goes in our mouth. And during this period of austerity that we're hearing about, people are strapped for cash. Is there any defence in we can't afford to eat properly? I don't accept that. I really don't accept that because even people who are really really on the sort of the the edge of existence as far as food is concerned food banks these days are very conscious of offering healthy food there are choices even there at the bottom of the food chain if you like and for other people it doesn't have to be expensive go and buy things that are 
you know, for your dinner tonight, that today is the expiry date and get a third off when you go to the supermarket. Walk to the supermarket and if you can um, and go and buy some things that are almost out of and, and reduced. I remember a friend of mine, he would go into the, the supermarket on his way home and he would ring his wife to say, right, I've got this and I've got that. And she would put the meal together according to what he had found reduced in the supermarket. If you want to do it, you can. And even uh, some of the better supermarkets, the high end, they do these meal deals. I know you've talked about them earlier, but actually healthy ones where you can get a meal for two for less than ten pounds. Surely that's cheaper than two Big Mac meals for a start. And that's a that's a big meal. I mean, if you, if you if you're looking at somebody like you know Marks and Spencers or, or Sainsbury's or Waitrose or one of those, for instance, um, you can go and get a three course meal with wine for ten pounds. Now, I, one of the, my favourites is a stir fry meal which I get um, and it's you get the chicken you get the stir fry vegetables you get the sauce and you get the noodles all in it for seven pounds and that is a fantastic meal for two it's healthy it's got no added anything to it it's all natural stuff but you know the sauce I'm sure it's got a few bits in but basically it doesn't have to be expensive go and buy yourself a chicken see what you can get out of that you you could have a roast chicken you could have chicken and sandwiches or in a salad afterwards you could go and put boil it up and make soup out of it uh, you could make a chicken and potato pie with some of the chicken bits that were left over there are so many things. and you can buy chicken for three pounds I'm a patron of Send a Cow charity and they asked me to do a, it was um, live for on a pound a day week um, and it was about a year ago or so ago as I did it and I filmed myself doing it so I had a pound it was fascinating to actually weigh out what could I eat for a pound and I had I chose some um, milk I had porridge oats so I had porridge for my breakfast I had a rice pudding for my lunch and for my evening meal I had a massive vegetable soup I did get a bit bored by the end of eating, I'd have to admit. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was, a, and I had, I had tea, because I, I love tea, um, and I managed to make a tea bag last for five cups. <laughs> got, wow. a bit, got a bit ragged by the end of that. <laughs> uh, but, but I could do it. So you think, come on, folks. You know, there are people in the world who are living on a pound a day. Um, and that even, whilst I wouldn't want to live on the food that I ate every day, it was nutritious. I had milk in there. I had vegetables in there, and I got my protein from the milk. Um, and it was it was doable. So, mm. if we want to make the effort, we can. But sometimes we, sometimes people aren't educated. One of the things about things like whether it be uh, Fair Share or other charities that are trying to help people who are really suffering at the the lower end. Um, they're trying to do educational training as to how to cook and how to eat healthily. And that's such a good thing. So anybody, please support those charities when you ever you have the opportunity. And very finally, you're 70. Now, I don't want to offend you, but I read an article in The Times a few weeks ago and it said, what's most miraculous about you at 70 is the fact that your face doesn't sag. How is this possible? Well, I use this little gadget called Facial Flex. And it basically is two ends held together with a rubber band that you squeeze together with your mouth. And it was designed by a surgeon in the States who was, um, he did, he was a plastic surgeon, and he reconstructed burns victims' faces. And he designed this so that he could try and get the muscles working again. And he found that his, his um, therapists who were helping to teach them all started looking younger so they then started marketing it as an anti-aging product and as a result of that um, it's, it's sold all over the world I think uh, this was sent to me as, as a sample back in oh it must be 20 years ago didn't use it for the first three years didn't really feel, feel I needed it and then gradually as the aging thing sort of creeps up on you I thought I would and then I applied my same um, sort of philosophy as you would do if you're teaching exercise and when you teach exercise weights if you're using weights in a gym the heavier the weights the bigger your muscles are going to get so I suddenly thought do you know what I'm going to make this I'm going to fast track it so I doubled up the bands on the first you have three three levels of band one two and three so I doubled up the number one and then I progressed to a number two and I doubled up the number two and now it's on number three 
and you're not supposed to double up the number three ones because it's that's too heavy um, but by putting it into your mouth like this wow <laughs> And that's basically what you, two minutes morning and night. And you're seriously telling me this can do what to your face? Because it, it it affects about 30 different muscles, doesn't yes. it? Yes, the 30 muscles from here. So from just under, it's nothing to do with your eyes. So it's not going to tone up anything here. But from here downwards, so what it does, it will help fill out this bit here, which normally sort of folds in as we get older. It will plump up this bit. We, women get lines going down. And it won't get rid of them completely, but it will pump them up a bit, plump them up a bit. We also get our lips get thinner as we get older. It plumps those up. It then goes on to, it lifts this, so it tones up the underneath of your face. And then it helps tone up your double chin. And then it helps your neck. And then it really helps down to your um, down to your chest and I had one lady ring me up she said in two weeks she could see her chest lifting and her whole chest looks so much better and so we are the people that sell this in the United Kingdom rosemaryconley.com um, and if you want to see more about it if you go to rosemaryconley.com forward, forward slash facial hyphen flex you'll go straight to that page and then you'll see the befores and afters that we've done um, and the interviews with the people that actually used it. I've got what I call my gobble gobble neck. It's a bit like a turkey. Is this just for women or can guys do it as well? well men can do it as well. There's no reason. You know, absolutely. That's one part of your face that I think is constructed just the same as ours. So uh, I don't think there's any reason why it wouldn't work for men. So this is a natural alternative to surgery, which a lot of people do, which can be very painful and often doesn't work, gets infected and is a nightmare. If you have cosmetic surgery on your face, have a facelift, it's so obvious. That's You see people on the television and you know that what age they are and they just don't look like them. And I just think, why do people do that? I would never do that. I think it's sad. I have in my time had Botox, don't now. I'd had it on my forehead. I looked ridiculous and my eyelids dropped. So that was no good. <laughs> I had it here, which I did up until about five years ago. I don't do it now. I think at seven. Great thing about being 70. Do you know what? You're allowed to get older now. Um, so that's really good. Um, but for, for saving this, it really does. It really does work. There's no question about it. The only, the only caveat I would say, if you've got a very, very, very tiny mouth, then I think you might find it difficult, but and that's unusual. I've only of all the, of all the thousands that we've sold, there's only been two people that have fallen into that category. Well, everybody knows I have a big mouth, so that's not going to be an issue, is it, Rosemary? Congratulations on everything. You're such an inspiration, and I hope you know what you've given to people over the years. Personally, for me, you made a great uh, difference in my life. You were so kind in sending those books 20 years ago. Amazing! I can't believe that you look so slim. And when you first arrived today, I didn't recognise you straight away. I recognised the voice and the face, but I, I didn't recognise the body. Well, you're very kind. It's a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of maintenance. But I think once you get there, it is worth it. And I think that's been your story through your entire career, isn't it? Giving people hope. Then when they see the results, then that's for them to continue or not, should they choose. It is lovely to change people's lives. That A lovely um, motivational speaker who I met very sadly died last year. Um, his name is Richard Denny. Um, and he said success is having something to aim for, somebody to share it with, and that what you do makes a difference. Um, I've been very privileged that, that I have, I believe I have made a difference. Congratulations on everything. You can find out more by going to rosemaryconnelly.com. Thank you for your time. Not at all. It's been a real pleasure.